You know that feeling when you've been sitting intently and working on something for a few hours and you suddenly come to and think, gosh, I have no concept of time. It's probably three o'clock in the afternoon and you look at your watch and realise it's gone seven and the day is pretty much over. Well, the last few weeks have kind of felt like that, except instead of, you know, checking my watch, I check my phone now because technology, that's a thing. And instead of having worked intently on something for two hours, I'm aware that I've done something. I'm just not entirely sure what that was or what it did or how I've been spending my time. And instead of it being just gone seven o'clock in the evening, it's, you know, June, apparently. Hello there Pickles and welcome to episode 45 of the Knitting Vicariously podcast. My name is Caroline, I'm found more commonly across Instagram and Ravelry as Dunderknit. I'm a knitter living in London in the UK and if this is your first time joining me here on the podcast, a rather large hello and welcome to you. I hope you are very well. I do like to give a very brief word of warning up front just to let you know that this is a swearing friendly podcast. The language, it can be a little colourful it can be a little robust and if that is not your thing I completely appreciate it however this will not be the podcast for you for those of you for whom language poses no barrier whatsoever or indeed for those of you who are coming back I really do appreciate you being here and I really do hope you're all marvellously well things here in London are still in a bit of a quasi lockdown sort of state here. We are starting to see a bit of a reopening around certain industries, certain uh, sort of commercial sites and shops. Um, we're starting to see schools potentially bringing some year groups back into play and um, thankfully at the moment it looks as though the infection rate is still staying pretty low. There's no immediate sign of a second wave so fingers still firmly crossed on that front that that can continues. Wherever you are right now, I very, very much hope that you are continuing to stay safe, stay healthy, and that you and your loved ones are all coping and managing lockdown as best you possibly can just now. Alongside the pandemic, with all of the difficulties and challenges it poses and folks just trying to get through the day to day, we're also seeing significant upheaval and demand for change following the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, three of the latest victims in an already long line of victims of police brutality. While this has brought the Black Lives Matter movement back to the forefront and increased demands for um, societal change, increased support for anti-racist projects and um, review of policing reform, racially motivated attacks and abuse are absolutely nothing new. This shouldn't be shocking to us, nor indeed is it unique to the US. Racism exists everywhere and manifests in every way from uh, verbal abuse all the way through to systemic inequality. Hopefully, however, what we're starting to see is a bit of a catalyst for change. I've talked about privilege before here on the podcast around about 18 months ago when some of the discussions around racism and diversity started gaining ground. Um, I spoke a little bit about it here on the podcast. Privilege for me manifests in a raft of different ways. Um, I tend to think of it most closely associated with comfort. I am generally comfortable most of the time. I think like many people I exist in this state of being fairly comfortable. And really when you come up against discussions about really deep ingrained and deep-seated inequalities um, founded along lines like race or social inequality, um, then you get to be uncomfortable pretty quickly. And those of us who sit naturally in this comfortable bucket, it's not a nice place to be. It's quite a difficult place to be. And we're always looking for ways to get back to that place of comfort where everything is back and kind of back to normal, if you like, within that world. And I guess the last few weeks have really kind of given rise to that again, this notion of we're in this really uncomfortable situation where we want to fix something or do something and the reality is there is no quick fix, there is no easy solution but that doesn't stop us wanting to try and do something and edge ourselves back to being that little bit more comfortable again. 
Now the good news in this is there are things that we can do, there are causes that we can support, there are difficult conversations that we can have with family and with friends, there are resources, excellent resources, that we can make use of, whether it be articles, books, handbooks that we can work through. But in all of these, these are all active things. We have to choose to do them and we have to choose to continue to be uncomfortable. There is a wonderfully moving video that Gigi, who is Gay Gillespie, put up on her YouTube channel. I will link it in the description box below. And her point there, her call to action for those who want to come out in support of the Black Lives Matter movement, in support of being anti-racist, was you have to stand in the gap. Now that's not something that we can do passively. We can't wring our hands and despair at how awful it is and hope that everything is going to get better. We have to take action, we have to choose to do the work and we have to therefore be uncomfortable, continue to be uncomfortable. Otherwise we are choosing to remain silent and quiet and that is akin to being complicit. If you choose to do the work by going out and protesting in many of the Black Lives Matter protests or similar things that are going on across the world at the moment, then all power to you. I hope you're able to stay safe, to stay healthy, to take whatever precautions you can, given obviously the pandemic that's happening at the same time. If you are able to donate and you choose to use that as a way of showing your support and doing the work here, um, then there are a plethora of funds, of charities, of um, bodies who are out there that would very, very happily and willingly take donations at this point in time. I've linked a few of them below. There is absolutely no shortage of them. To that point, I will be taking the advertising revenue from this YouTube channel um, for the rest of this month. Um, it's not a huge amount of money. It usually covers the cost of my time to sort of record or edit the podcast. So I will be matching whatever I'm able to get off the back of this month. And I'll be donating that to Neighbourhood Fibre Company. They have announced their Momentum Fund, which funds a series of different projects in and around their area. Um, and again, I will link to that in the description box below for you to take a look there and see if that's something that you would like to support as well. But obviously just by watching uh, this channel, hopefully you're showing a bit of support there as well because that will form part of the donation. Um, so if that's what you choose to do, then wonderful. One thing we can all choose to do is educate ourselves, have those difficult conversations, make use of the amazing assets and resources that there are out there whether they be articles, books, handbooks, and um, yeah, really seeking to have the, the difficult conversations with friends and with families and hopefully drive a little bit more change that way. It is uncomfortable, it will be uncomfortable, but that is a very, very small price to pay for potentially de delivering such a big catalyst of change. A little bit closer to home within the community, there are other things that we can do to highlight and really show our support for black makers here within the crafting community. One initiative I just wanted to call out is the BIPOC in Fibre website, which was created by Jeanette Sloan here in the UK. This is a website that is designed to highlight and showcase makers of colour, whether they be knitwear, crochet designers, whether they be bloggers, YouTubers. There is a wealth and a plethora of talent that is showcased over on this website and it's something that I've taken great delight in going through and discovering new makers to follow and to support and I would urge you to do the same. Now this isn't necessarily about kind of supporting people because of the colour of their skin, this is about being able to circumvent things like Instagram algorithms and the fact that historically, as we talked about this time last year, our um, community, our craft, hasn't always done the best job of highlighting and bringing makers of colour to the fore. And so what this does is it helps us discover these individuals and their talents for ourselves, start following them, and then really just start to see the amazing things that they're bringing to life within the community and um, continue to show our support for them over time. So hopefully um, you will endeavour to do the same, support those makers and um, really just start to diversify our feeds and um, bring a little bit more of, as I say, their incredible talents to the forefront within our community as well. 
And indeed, speaking of knitting, it is probably about time that I share with you a little bit of what I've been working on over the last few weeks. One thing to mention right up front, as I usually do, is that show notes for this week's episode, some of the links that I mentioned in passing in that section up front, as well as more about what I talk about in this week's episode, can be found in the description box below. You'll also be able to find them over in our Ravelry group. We have the Knitting Vicariously podcast group in Ravelry. Ravelry. You can search us by searching for Knitting Vicariously over in the groups tab there. It is a wonderfully active group. We have a series of different threads and kind of just general amazing chatter that are engaged over there on a fairly regular basis. We have a show us your actual knits threads where people can showcase some of the projects they've been working on. We have some vicarious knitting threads where people show off the various projects or patterns that have inspired them over the last few weeks there too. So I would urge you if you're not already a member to head on over there and join in the discussions. We also have the Knitting Vicariously Instagram account where each um, episode I will post um, the relevant hashtags and makers for anyone that I've mentioned there and that gives you an opportunity to stalk them a little more gently over on Instagram too. This is usually the point in the episode where I talk about what I'm wearing, where it is knitwear related and uh, that knitwear is pretty thin on the ground because aforementioned June. However, I will just take a moment to mention that I am wearing my fabulous earrings by Malika. These are little crocheted wire earrings with some fabulous little um, crystals on there too. I will endeavour to get a little bit more personal, up close personal and up in your business just to showcase those momentarily. Here you are, you're getting a lovely close up of my ear here, but these are my little earrings from Malika. As I mentioned, I will link her in the description box below. These are my teardrop earrings, my little hexagon earrings, and I have these in a couple of colours. There are these rose gold beauties here with these kind of lovely um, sort of magenta burgundy colour crystals. I also have a silver pair with some green crystals on there too and I absolutely adore these. If you're in the hunt for something that is a little bit sort of knitwear crochet adjacent, you just want to give a little a nudge to your crafty tendencies. One, these are beautiful uh, and really do go with pretty much everything if I'm honest, but also manage to be just incredibly well made. Soraya is ridiculously talented and um, those of you who've been around for a while know how much I enjoy her jewellery. So yes, I will include her in the description box below, the link to her web store there. Please do feel free to pop on over and check it out. Sadly, I have no finished objects for you this time round. I know there are a couple of sweaters still in progress and um, I know that two episodes ago I spoke about my Sorrel as well as my Morning in Engelberg sweater. Both of those are still on the needles and I will confess I have been getting a little bit of love and attention. The Sorrel pullover I will absolutely confess is, is a little bit off to one side at the moment. Now, that is broadly speaking because during this pandemic, uh, it is fair to say the size that I started knitting is going to be a tiny bit more snug than I originally anticipated. That is not going to stop me from working on it for any prolonged period of time, but it does mean that just the urgency is probably a little bit reduced. Similarly, the fact that it is uh, a sweater with mohair held together with fingering weight means it's going to be incredibly snugly and not entirely seasonally appropriate. So um, for now, that is sitting off to one side and giving me lovely longing looks every time I sit on the sofa downstairs. But um, my morning in Engelberg sweater, I mean, I have put a couple of rounds on it, but really not enough to be able to showcase any progress to you. The project that I talked about last time, however, has definitely been getting a little bit more of my focus and attention. Yes, indeed, those of you who tuned into the previous episode will be aware that I was caught somewhat by surprise with the pandemic pottiness that has taken hold and uh, given rise to cast on the Battenberg blanket by Sandra Paul. This is a gorgeous crochet blanket, I know, 
I will include the pattern picture alongside here, where loads and loads and loads, the technical uh, term, of tiny, tiny crocheted squares are um, combined together to create a really, really beautiful effect. Now, what um, Sandra Paul tends to do with her design is she has you have a coloured square next to a um, neutral square, and then those kind of pepper through the rest of the blanket. I received a fair few different folks who recommended that rather than doing white squares, I could do gold squares. That would feel entirely more in keeping with my aesthetic. Thank you for your thoughts on this. I mean, you're not wrong, and I probably do have enough yarn <laughs> to be able to do exactly that. However, the original pattern with the more sort of neutral squares was really what made my heart sing, and so I did make sure that I had a little bit of neutral yarn to get me started. I have done a bit more work on this. Not only have I crocheted up a few more coloured squares, they are no longer in quite the beautiful kind of colourful rainbow that they were last time round because I've got to the point where I'm just shoving additional squares into the centre here. You can see there's still a sort of hint of colour rainbow doing the round, uh, but more and more increasingly they're just getting dumped into the top of this really very, very full bowl. <laughs> I do need to think about decanting some of these. But alongside that, I have also started to join some of these together. And so, to give you a bit of a progress update, I will showcase the first little corner that we have here. Yes, you can see that there is a nice little corner of squares that's starting to be worked up. I've yet to decide if this is definitely going to be the top left-hand corner of the blanket. Um, but one of the great things about this pattern is that you're actually joining as you go. So it's not a case of needing to have, and I did do the maths on this, about a thousand and fifteen squares. I know it's terrifying when I say it out loud, isn't it? It's not a case of needing to have every single one of those done and then undertaking the behemoth task of starting to join all of them together. No, indeed, when you do the, um, the neutral squares, there are instructions given within the pattern for you to join as you go. And indeed, if I turn you around and show you the wizard behind the curtain on the back, you will see how that starts to take place. So what you have is, as and when you have crocheted your cream square, um, you then take the yarn and start to work from the back side and you are actually then crocheting the edges together on the surrounding squares. Um, it is a free pattern, so I'm not giving away a huge amount by um, explaining that. I'm also not explaining it well enough to give it away even if it were a paid for pattern, let's be honest. Um, it's the sort of thing that to crochet up a coloured square is pretty quick for me. I am by no means a master crocheter. Uh, I'm still definitely, definitely learning. Um, but I can do a little coloured crocheted square, so one of these in maybe seven or eight minutes, I can, I can whip one of these bad boys out. Um, to do a neutral square, to actually do the square itself again is about the same amount of time, but then to go and to join it, probably takes that length of time again. Um, because it is a little bit fiddly, it's, you know, there's a lot of rotating that's going on. Obviously, the bigger that these portions get, there's more to move around as you go from sort of edge to edge. But, um, but I'm hoping I'll get a little bit faster than that as I go on. This is one of the sections that I've joined together. I'm trying to keep them relatively manageable. And then I think what I'll do is once I have a few big sections like this, I will then seek to join them together. So this is the first big section that I have. And then this is the second one here, which is very much a work in progress. You can see that I sort of started with one cream square put uh, four on each, well, one on each edge, and then sort of created a second cream square joining together two with an incremental two, and kind of carry on from there. I don't really have much in the way of a system when it comes to placing some of these colours. I did dally very briefly with the idea of like a gradient spectrum, somewhat inspired by Amy Florence and her beautiful rainbow blankets at the moment. I then realised that that was a lot of organisation would probably require me to finish off all of the coloured squares before starting to join them and place them accordingly because like my level of desire to want to be quite specific with colours and not fuck anything up is such that I would have needed to lay all of it. I just, 
it's the sort of thing that was going to make my brain eat itself in all honesty so I decided to be what I'm going to call purposefully random <laughs> with all of these squares. So broadly speaking, all that I'm trying to do is find squares that when placed in immediately proximity to each other, either there's a bit of kind of commonality between the two of them. So, you know, there's a bit of orange in this one. There's a little bit of green in that one too. I'm not going to go and put another orange one here. That's going to be a bit too much. I mean, it's it's all fairly straightforward stuff. It's not quite, you know, picking one out from random, but um, but being a little bit conscious about how I want to place some of these things and sort of thinking here, for instance, well, you know, we could do with something in the blue family. So maybe there'll be another sort of slightly warmer colour over here when I get to it, you know straightforward stuff but um but yeah I think by the end of it it'll be nice and I do think as well by having these cream squares being fairly consistent being very kind of neutral not variegated you manage to have a kind of consistency that takes the place over the rest of the blanket as well even though you have um, a mixture of kind of fairly vibrant squares and some that are perhaps a little bit more kind of variegated or pastel in some instances so Hopefully, as this blanket project continues, you'll start to see a little bit more kind of, um, I want to say diversity, but also a bit of homogeny in there as well, because why not? I mentioned last time round, I am using a three millimetre crochet hook to crochet up these squares and link them together. Here is my aforementioned crochet hook. This is just a really, really simple clover crochet hook. It has a nice bit of um, sort of rubber moulding, which makes it nice and comfy to hold and to hook as I go through. I also have here um, the progress that I was making in joining these two together. So if I just pop my crochet hook through the loop on the back here and show you, so you can see that there's a bit of this ridge here on the back where the two have been joined together. Um, I finished the cream crochet square on this corner, pulled the yarn through to the back and then joined these two and I'm sort of linking them, if you can see here, just underneath all of these edge stitches as I go. So what I'm going to be doing now is I will pop another coloured square. I will um, put these two so they are so the, the front of this white one is facing the front of a coloured one just here and then I will be crocheting them together, just chain stitching them together here along the top as I go. Um, and then similarly down here and then down here as well. That makes some degree of sense. I will say that the instructions and the video that Sandra puts together on her website are incredibly clear and very easy to follow, particularly for someone like me who has no real understanding of crochet and not much in the way of skill to speak of. They were very easy for even me to follow. So hopefully if you are a relative crochet newbie, much like myself, you shouldn't have too many problems with that either. I am really, really glad that I've started working on these cream squares. It's starting to kind of bring everything to life a little bit, but um, it's definitely emphasising I've got a long old way to go. The cream yarn, just to be clear, is yarn that I purchased from a website called Yarn Undyed here in the UK. They have a wealth of different bases of different weights, all of which, as the name suggests, are undyed. So um, potentially if you want to play around perhaps with food colouring or with some acid dyes, these would be a great um, supplier to take a look at and get some yarns in sort of reasonably small quantities. They come in individual skeins or packs of five. Um, I ordered quite a few skeins because obviously yardage wise, I'm gonna need a fair amount of yarn. I ordered this cream color here, which is gonna be almost impossible to show you on camera, but I will endeavor to do so. So you may be able to see this is a fingering weight yarn. It's also a high twist fingering weight yarn. So I mentioned in the previous episode that some of the mini skeins that I was really enjoying working with were kind of 80-20 uh, merino nylon blends, but particularly the high twist ones with this slight additional kind of texture. They're a tiny bit thicker 
than some of the standard four ply sock yarns. Um, the high twist yarn tends to be a tiny bit plumper, but it's something I really, really enjoy working with. So having this as the kind of core that I'm using across the whole of the blanket, again, is gonna make it lovely and thick and squishy and um, just something I am really enjoying working with. All of the other minis and yarns that I'm using are a series of different mini skeins or leftovers or kind of tiny skeins that I received in swaps years ago now. Essentially, I'm trying to make use of whatever scraps and leftovers and mini skeins of fingering weight I have and lobbing them into this blanket. Each of the squares, each of the colored squares takes somewhere in the region of about one and a half grams. So again, depending on the, the weight of the yarn, obviously some of the slightly thicker fingering weight yarn is a little bit heavier, um, but it does mean that I'm able to get quite a few squares out of even the smallest of minis. So for instance if I were to take something like this this is hedgehog fibers in the Monet colorway this is their sock yarn it's a leftover from a featherweight cardigan that I knit a good few years back um, a sort of little mini about this size I would probably be able to get at least three squares out of this if not even eking out a fourth. So I'm able to get a fair bit of yardage out of even, or a fair few squares out of even the tiniest of scraps. So trying to make the best use of that as I can. So yes, that is my Battenberg blanket. It is coming along nicely and as ever, the ability to crank out a square or two over the course of an evening is keeping my productivity tingling along nicely. So again, if you are in the market for something where you just want to be able to bash out a few squares, feel a little bit productive, I would definitely recommend that blanket pattern as something that can help you with that. Now, of course, I mentioned that I have a couple of jumpers on the go, and as such, my morning in Engelberg has been getting a tiny bit of attention, not a huge amount, however. Uh, and of course, I have my blanket on the go. I have a wealth of other whips at my disposal. And so it only makes sense, of course, that I cast on a new sweater. What? Yeah, I know. But them's the breaks. So recently I have been looking at slightly more kind of summery patterns. I mentioned of course it is June, um, although today it's a little bit greyer and a little bit colder than it has been the last few weeks. We've had outrageous sunshine for quite a while now and certainly the last few days have been a little bit cooler. I will say however I am lucky enough to have a little bit of outdoor space here, um, a, a little sort of rear patio that I can sit out on but what I will say is it tends to get a huge amount of sun um, sort of in the first part of the day round to about four o'clock in the afternoon and then it's almost entirely in the shade. Now being a natural redhead Scottish person being in the shade is very much my happy place but it is also potentially a tiny bit on the chilly side some evenings and so I'd started to think a little bit about having just a little lightweight thing to kind of throw on and keep me a tiny Tiny bit more cozy. I took a look at a couple of the patterns out there and one pattern that has been continually coming up in my feed for the last few years now is Ranunculus. This is a pattern by Midori Hirose. I will include the pattern picture here. However, I will issue the same caveat as I have done previously when talking about this pattern, which is don't judge it based on that pattern picture. There are a wealth of other individuals who've knit this, who've made it in different yarn weights, um, who've knit it in different sizes. I'll come on to that in a second. And as such, it looks very different on a lot of different individuals. It's only really since seeing other people's versions of this pattern that it's caught my eye and really been something that I want to spend a bit more time working on. Um, because this original pattern picture really doesn't do it justice. So this is a pattern that is knit out of fingering weight and lace weight held together. Um, it is, again, like so many of the other patterns out there, like um, Tin Can Knit's Love Note sweater, um, like, <clears throat> I mean, Sorrel, for example. Um, it's again, it's it's uh, like Jessie Martinson's, uh, Jessie Mae Martinson's Cozy Raglan sweater. There are so many different designs out there that make use of uh, mohair or a kind of fuzzy yarn held together with a fingering weight yarn. The difference with Ranunculus is also it's knit at quite a loose gauge. So the recommended needle size is a six millimeter needle, which is a US size 10. What you tend to find with a lot of the fingering weight sweaters is you'll knit them on a kind of a US size 
five or six, which are 3.75 or four millimeter needle. Knitting them at a looser gauge obviously makes them a little bit airier, a little bit drapier, and um, just a little bit flowier in general. Now, again, I was thinking about the sort of use and the purpose for uh, a sweater like this, something that I could throw on and keep very cozy. And I knew I wanted something that was super lightweight. Um, and certainly some of the things like my sorrel pullover, having uh, a jumper that's knit at that kind of gauge is great, but it's very cozy. Um, by contrast, this is something that's a bit airier, a bit floatier, but I still didn't want something that was necessarily going to be quite as weighty as the kind of fingering and lace weight held together. Now, those of you who saw uh, my Unravel um, stash enhancements from earlier on this year, so this is back when fibre festivals were a thing, remember those? Distant memory now. They will come back again, I'm quite sure. But um, when I went to Unravel in Farnham in Surrey earlier on this year, back in February, I was perusing some of the stands and came across a new base from Ching Fiber. Ching Fiber is a wonderful yarn dyer who's based here in London in the UK. And the base in question that caught my eye was called Veronita. Their Veronita base is a frankly obscenely soft and delightful cashmere blend. It's a cashmere silk blend. It has about 300 meters to the skein. It's a 25 gram skein and is an excellent substitute for anyone who's potentially sensitive to mohair or just doesn't like the sort of feeling of knitting with mohair held together with something else, for instance. It's a great, great substitute for that. And um, I brought some skeins of that back in this beautiful kind of soft heathery pink color way and was really kind of thinking about what it was that I wanted to do and work on with this yarn. It's such a wonderfully lightweight yarn. I was racking my brain around it. And then of course, Ranunculus caught my eye and I thought, oh, well, it'd be lovely to hold that Veronita base with something else, wouldn't it? I mean, that would make a really nice kind of, again, fingering weight, lace weight sweater. Or I could really double down on this shit and I could hold the Veronita yarn together with itself and make a super lightweight, super soft, super floofy sweater. And when you've doubled down on yarn that you've already purchased where you're like, oh, well, you know, I could certainly try and do that. I probably probably don't have enough. I probably do need to go and buy a couple of extra skeins. And then you think to yourself, well, you know, I'm doubling down on that. I may as well really, really go whole hog. Um, yeah, so I bought a sweater's quantity of yarn inspired by my Unravel purchase, but in a different colour. Because um, logic, that's that's what that was. So um, here is the Ching fibre that I am using to knit my version of Ranunculus. I will show you the pattern that I'm working on the project that I have momentarily. But just before I do that, let me show you this yarn here. So as I mentioned, Ching fibre in this frankly ridiculous cashmere silk blend. Here it is. You have the Veronita base in the frankly aptly named colourway grey you can't dispute it. It's not imaginative, but it is accurate. Um, this is, as I mentioned, 75%, sorry, 79% cashmere and 21% silk. It is so incredibly soft. And what I will say, so again, you have 300 meters to a 25 gram skein. Um, it is cashmere, but it is roughly in line price-wise with what you would pay for uh, an indie dyed skein of mohair silk. So these skeins are roughly, um, I think about 25 pounds each when purchased directly from the website. So again, roughly in line with uh, the price of mohair. And um, for that, you are getting cashmere. So again, if you're looking for a substitute, perhaps something that you want to take a look at and bear in mind. So, this is what caught my eye. As I mentioned, I do have a couple of skeins in this beautiful kind of mauvey, uh, sort of heathery pink base, but actually this felt so much more kind of practical for me, chucking it on over um, sort of smaller tops or dresses during summer months. And, um, and so, yeah, that was what I decided to work on. Now, because this is knit on six millimetre needles, it is a bit of a speedy knit, and it's fair to say I've made a fair whack of progress on this already. So let me showcase my ranunculus in progress. Yep, you can see 
it's a little bit difficult to see, but you can see there is a bit of the texture joke here. There's a bit of lace that's done and a bit more texture underneath it. I have my sleeves separated and sitting on waist yarn, and I am continuing to knit down the body of this sweater. Now, um, the body is going to be sort of high waist. I'm not gonna do it super cropped because that is not my personal preference. Um, so there is a little bit more of a way to go before I'm able to get to the um, the ribbing on the bottom. Just pull it down so you can see a little bit more accurately where I'm at with this. But um, yeah, I am just in raptures with how this is knitting up. Um, it is knit at a loose gauge, as you can see, but at the same time, for all that I'm holding two lace weight yarns together, it's not hugely see-through. I mean, don't get me wrong, there will need to be a bit of a modesty vest top underneath this, absolutely. Um, there's certainly going to need to be a modesty bra. That would be a very different sweater altogether and a very different occasion, I suspect. But in all of this, I think it's fair to say that um, actually holding these two lace weight yarns double or holding this lace weight yarn double, I should say, has made for a far more kind of opaque and um, really kind of substantial looking jumper than I had originally expected, which I'm very, very pleased about. All that said, this is still going to be so incredibly lightweight and kind of just the sort of thing that can get chucked in a bag. It will be perfect for popping on, as I say, when it does get a tiny bit chilly. Um, I've been contemplating the arm length. The pattern offers a couple of different options, whether it be short sleeves or whether it be slightly longer ones. I think I'm going to go with at least elbow length, possibly just below elbow. I'll see how I get on with yardage and whatnot as well. So um, yes, this is just an absolute joy to work on right now. I um, finished the first two skeins, having held those together. I am now just cracking into the second two skeins. I don't think I will need to crack into this fifth one at all. Um, I should be able to get more than enough yardage out of the um, two lots of two skeins that I'm holding double. Two lots of two skeins, well, the four skeins that I'm using for the sweater words. Um, and so yeah, I reckon I will have the perfect little summer throwover um, pullover to um, yeah, just keep me a little bit cosy on some of those chillier nights. Now, I do want to talk very briefly about sizing because that is one of the things that this pattern has uh, perhaps suffered a little with over um, previous months and times when I'd looked at it before. So the pattern is sized in a slightly odd way. There is one original document which is one size and that one size has been knit with a fairly significant amount of ease um, but it is sized to fit up to a 30, I think a 36 or 38 inch bust. Now obviously that is not particularly size inclusive, I think it's probably fair to say. Um, but even with that, there is a fair bit of ease that is placed into the sweater pattern itself. It is designed to be knit, as the original pattern picture suggests, with a fair degree of ease. Subsequently, there is an additional um, uh, download as part of the pattern itself. And within that download, you have additional sizing options and those go up to a size 48 inch bust. Bear with me because again, that is not exactly what you would call size inclusive. However, once again, this has been knit with ease built into the pattern. So actually for all that it says, the largest size that it goes up to is a 48 inch bust. The finished bust measurement of the sweater itself for that size 48 inch bust is actually a 65 and a quarter inch. Now, again, I appreciate this is a pattern that is designed to be knit with a significant amount of ease. So therefore finding that the largest size it's been designed for is a 48 inch bust is not brilliant. However, based on the images that I have seen, based on those who've knit it previously, based on the sizes, shapes, testimonials of different knitters who have made this in the past, I would still say it is worth looking at this pattern because the amount of intended ease is frankly a bit swampy, if you ask me. I'm personally knitting the 38 inch bust size. I am a good few inches bigger than that. I'm probably about six inches bigger than that at the moment. Um, and so that is going to give me an intended ease of about, I think a further six or so inches. 
And as part of that, you know, again, I appreciate that that still means that at the upper end of the scale, if you assume maybe six, six inches of ease, it's still not as size inclusive as you'd like it to be. So yes, for all that the pattern itself finishes at a 48, if this is a pattern that piques your interest and your bust size is larger than that, I do still think it is worth taking a look at some of the other patterns and examples that people have worked on in the past to see if this is something that still might work for you because that significant amount of ease, I think, you know, personally at my bust size, it's too much. Um, I want it to have a little bit of drape. I want it to have a decent amount of hang. I don't want it to be swamping me. If that is the sort of fit that you're after, it still might work for you. Um, with the, the the relative degree of ease that you like to have so maybe still worth a quick look again i'd love it to be a bit more size inclusive i do think there are options for the designer to do exactly that um, but again i still think it could be a pattern that might work really nicely for you so yes that is pretty much what i have been working on for the last few weeks as i say my obsession with the crochet blanket continues my desire to want to get a nice cozy little over jumper doodah for the colder things in the watsit because words um that is also coming along nicely but i'm going to move along briefly now into stash enhancement it is fair to say that i have been a little bit more restrained than usual part of that is down to spending a bit less time online i think i mentioned last time round um that given i'm spending pretty much the entirety of my days at the moment my work days at the moment staring at a screen i'm trying to do a little bit less of that now in the evenings whether that be a bit more time spent crafting or you know i'm not going to deny i'm still watching a little bit of kind of films telly catching up with some games and so on but um yeah for the most part i'm trying not to spend too much time on the internet and instagram and so on and so forth so um it is it's my my mustache buying or my, my yarn buying has taken a little bit of a back seat however i did make an exception and uh, part of that exception has just fallen on the floor one second please Yes, I do have a little pile of yarn on my lap at the moment and the person to blame for that is the wonderful Stacy, and that's Stacy Elston of Stress Knits. Stacy is someone who I am delighted to have known for a number of years now. She is also the reason that you are watching this right now uh, because it was Stacy for those who've watched since the very, very early days of Knitting Vicariously. Uh, it was Stacy who was to blame for me trying out a podcast in the first instance um she and i had been chatting for i think a couple of years by that point and um she was definitely the one that gave me a bit of a kick in the arse to to start taking things seriously and, and putting things online so um yeah she's to blame for so much of the gibberish that you have to sit and listen through um but she is also to blame for my most recent purchase because stacy has really exercised and executed marvelously on her and my love of all things gold. Those of you who watch Stacey's podcast, and if you don't, you absolutely should, I will link it in the description box below. She has the Stress Knits podcast, and on there she spoke recently about a new colour that she has developed as part of her yarn dyeing line. This is the colour Sunflower. She posted about it over on Instagram, and it's fair to say that my heart, my little gold-loving heart, was entirely captivated um just i mean there was nothing i could do i was powerless to resist this is her sunflower colorway and those of you who know anything about me or can tell anything about me may recognize that this is entirely up my alley yes this is her as i mentioned sunflower colorway a new gold color of hers and this is on her favorite sock base which is correspondingly one of my favourite bases. It is an 8020 merino nylon blend. I will hold it up here for you to see and appreciate in all of its beauty. And I mean, isn't it a beauty? So um, yes, I could not resist shopping this and nabbing this in her most recent update. It is an absolute joy and just the perfect, perfect gold. So I have three skeins of this, but um. This isn't the only gold that she dyes, and I know, I know different folks have slightly different interpretations of the word gold, and I know that mine is broader than most, but um, alongside this in her update was also Rust Belt, 
and rust belt is admittedly a little bit more on the sort of burnt orange coppery side of things but also I mean very much in my wheelhouse so um correspondingly I think a few skeins of this had to to come my way as well and so I have this is also on her favorite sock base I have now three skeins of each of these colors both of which will be sweaters at some point because because they're just beautiful. Um, Stacy is an absolute colour genius. A lot of her colours are incredibly beautiful, muted sort of pastel tones. Her colour sense is incredible. I have quite a few skeins of hers uh, in cubbies that you can't quite see. Um, she's someone that I've enjoyed supporting for quite some time now. But um, I mean, it's fair to say that, you know, the the colourways that she's been producing, her golds in particular, they really do just capture my little gold loving heart. So look, powerless, powerless to resist is is all that I can say at this stage. I mean, just, just perfect, absolutely perfect. And Stacey, you are a wizard. I have told you this before. I will tell you it again. I am quite, quite sure. But how could I possibly resist these goodies? I mean, beautiful. There was one other skein of hers that caught my eye and this is again because Floof has captured my heart recently as well. There was a skein of hers on her cloud base. This is her 74% baby Surya alpaca, 26% mulberry silk base. It is a lace weight yarn with 328 yards and this is her sweet disposition colorway. Again, this is Again, this is a truly incredible example of Stacey's work. It is peachy and has hints and flecks of gold in there too. It has slightly reddish tones in places. There's spots where it's a little bit more neutral leaning. It is just spectacular. And um, again, I saw this on Stacey's website and I knew I wanted this to make its way over the pond and spend a little bit of time with me here too. This is the sort of colourway that again, as and when I get round to knitting Andrea Mowry's pink velvet sweater, would make a great contrast colour, potentially. How do we feel about those two together? That could be fun. That could be very fun, um, but potentially would make a great contrast colour for the yoke portion of that there too. So, you know, again, for science. It was important to have this in my stash and I'm very delighted that it made its way to me here. So thank you again so, so much, Stacey, for all that you do, uh, whether it be nudging people in the direction of talking shit on the internet on a semi-regular basis or indeed just creating beautiful yarns for the rest of us to enjoy. I am incredibly grateful to you on all counts. Moving along now into vicarious knitting and I am looking forward to sharing with you some of the patterns that have caught my eye over the last few weeks. In keeping with the discussion that we had right up front in this week's episode, I want to take this opportunity to use this platform as a means of elevating and drawing attention to three incredible black designers who are doing some truly, truly amazing work. Um, in one instance, this is someone whose pattern has been recommended to me a couple of times in the last few weeks. Uh, the other two are, an in are individuals that I have had the absolute joy of meeting in person and so wanted to make sure that I'm calling out their work here because they are all incredibly talented and deserve to be recognised along those lines. So the first pattern is one that a couple of folks have suggested to me in direct messages over the last few days and this is the Stepping Stones cardigan by Rebecca McKenzie. I will include her pattern picture alongside here just to give you a little taste of how wonderful this is. It is an open fronted cardigan with a little bit of lace down either side of those front panels. Um, it is knit in DK weight yarn and it is a beautiful example of the perfect throw on cardigan that I think Think all of us are in need of in our wardrobes. This is a pattern that is knit from the bottom up but it is knit seamlessly so for all that it may be a little bit sloggy for those of us who are perhaps less inclined to work on the bottom up designs it does mean that actually once you get up there to the top there are no seams to worry about there's a three needle bind off to bring it all into place and that lace is I think sort of potato chippy enough to make you keep going throughout. As I mentioned it's DK weight yarn so again a good sort of medium weight opportunity for a nice kind of cozy throw on cardigan there too. 
In terms of sizing, this does a really, really great job on the size inclusivity front. The smallest size is about 36 and a quarter inches. Now that includes the ease that's built into it and of course the gap at the front. So it should be there a little bit oversized for some of the smaller bus sizes amongst us all the way up to I think a 74 and a quarter inch for those at the upper end of the scale. So again, for all sizes, something that gives us a little bit of room to cozy up inside it here too, which is fantastic. One thing also to call out at this point is that this pattern is going to be discounted until the 16th of June. The pattern that it's the price that it's available for on Ravelry has that discount already applied. There's no additional code that's necessary. And Rebecca has also called out the fact that 15% of the proceeds generated from the sale of the pattern itself are going towards the Loveland Foundation as well. So again, another opportunity for you to support both an incredible cause and a fantastic maker and on top of that, you're getting an amazing cardigan pattern to boot. So um, yeah, I think it's winning all round as far as I'm concerned with this pattern. It's really, really beautiful and a chance to support a great cause as well. The second pattern that I wanted to draw your attention to this week is the Everyday Lined Hat by Denise Bayron. I will include her pattern picture here with she and both her very dashing male model as well showcasing this gorgeous hat. Now, this is a knitting pattern with a bit of a difference because in Denise's own words, this is a pattern that is designed to help non-knitters, so sewists, learn a little bit more about knitting and similarly knitters help to experience a little bit more about sewing because as the pattern name would suggest this is a lined hat. Now she talks about it in the introduction in her Ravelry pattern page as being one where it can use a static uh, uh, sort of satin lining to minimise static that potentially it's something where you could use a little microfiber fleece to keep it extra specially cosy or or indeed for those of you who are living in warmer climes, potentially lining this with a bit of a moisture wicking um, fabric there as well. So it's not just about creating a lined hat that's going to keep you super warm, it has a bunch of other potential properties as well for all sorts of climates to boot. The knitting portion of the hat is knit in a worsted weight yarn, but she gives you incredibly extensive instructions for how to then apply this sewing portion and the lining of the hat as well. So again, for those like myself who have dabbled gently in sewing, I mean, my sewing is about up there with my crocheting, so let's be honest, could do with a fair bit of work. This is the sort of pattern that will guide me really, really helpfully through that process. And again, for those of you who perhaps have some sewist friends who want to learn a little bit more about knitting, or indeed for those of you who are just dipping a toe in knitting yourselves, this is gonna be a great way to understand a little bit more about hat construction and starting to think about creating the types of garments that are gonna keep you in all sorts of weathers nice and protected from the elements. And for those of you established knitters who think, well, you know, I'm not sure if this is for me, one other thing to add, this is a hat that's knit from the top down. So rather than being knit from the cuff up or the brim up, as you would expect, with a lot of hat patterns out there, this one starts at the very tip of the hat and increases outwards. So again, perhaps something new for you to try. Either way, all of Denise's patterns are not only incredibly elegant, but also incredibly well written. And so I definitely would urge you to take a look at that if this is something that strikes your fancy. And the last pattern that I want to call out this week are the Izzy Mitts. Now I will include the pattern picture here, but these are part of a set by the wonderful Jimenez Joseph. Uh, this is Jimmy Knits, who is uh, a fabulous designer based here in the UK. And these are just the most beautiful pair of textured and cabled mittens. I mentioned these are part of a set. She also has the Izzy cowl as well. And so if you're in the market for a matching set, you could do both and have a little bit of time to spare if it perhaps is something that you want to knit for. Dare I say it? <laughs> It'll be here before you know it. I mean, it's already June for goodness sake. <laughs> They come in a few different sizes. She has small, medium and large sizes written up as part of the pattern. And the way that she talks about them is they're part sort of woven, textured, ribbed and cabled as well. So again, a load of techniques to just pique your interest while you're working through these. Um, in terms of the cabling design, again, they sit uh, the cabling means it kind of cinches in and sits really nicely and cosily around your hands. And 
I, for one, am a massive, massive fan of fingerless mitts in the colder months. I'm constantly um, either reaching for my sort of card if I'm on public transport, um, or I will be dicking around with my phone more often than not. I might even be breaking out the knitting on the tube on the way into work in the mornings back when, you know, going into work in the mornings was a thing. So again, hopefully by the time it, co it, cools, it cools down, cools down here in the UK, um, I'll have the option to use these again on public transport in the mornings, but definitely something it is worth taking a look at. As I mentioned, they're knit in DK weight yarn. They should be more than easy to get out of a single skein of DK weight yarn. And so as such, would make a perfect little um, present or potentially just a little nice set of uh, wrist warmers to knit up for yourself prior to it getting that little bit chillier. Or if you're down under and chilliness is very much upon you, might be worth considering these as something to get you through the colder months to come. Moving along now, and it is time to move into your knits for the last few weeks. Now, as ever, you are doing a sterling job over in the Ravelry group of providing inspiration to all of us, where we have, as I mentioned before, the show us your actual knits thread, where you are showcasing some of the things you've been working on during lockdown. And I am delighted to be sharing a couple of these projects with you here. The first one that I want to call out in this episode is this frankly stunning outfit. Um, it is the Rizzo sweater by Amy Apple and this has been knitted by Theo BK. The pattern picture, sorry, the project picture that I'm including here is hers and what you can see is she's already got a full outfit to go with it. That is absolutely planning that I can get behind, mostly because it is the sort of planning that I will never ever be able to undertake myself. I, I aspire to it, I really do, but frankly this is the sort of shit that I do not have together in any form. <laughs> So I'm just deeply envious of it. I'm also envious of this beautiful green sweater. The Rizzo sweater, as I mentioned, it's a pattern by Amy Apple and it is this incredibly beautiful little cropped, quite kind of fitted um, sweater design. It has little cap sleeves. It has this beautiful detailing here on the yoke portion here too. And to Theo BK's comments that she wrote over on her pattern page, this is one of the most interesting constructions that she's worked up. It is knit from the top down uh, and it is knit seamlessly, I believe. But um, again, from what I've seen, there's some real interest and intrigue in the way that the whole piece is put together. Uh, I know that Amy Apple's designs have this really beautiful, slightly vintagey aesthetic to them. And um, again, I can say in terms of the planning that's gone into putting together this wardrobe, this whole outfit, I think this is going to look absolutely stellar. So not only is this a fantastic garment, beautifully knit, but beautifully styled as well. Definitely worth checking out. The Rizzo top itself is knit out of fingering weight yarn. In terms of sizing, it does okay. It is sized from a 30 inch bust up to a 54. So ideally we'd have an extra couple of sizes up at the upper end of that bracket as well. Um, but as I say, it is intended to be quite fitting. So at least you don't have too much in the way of ease to worry about at that point. But um, yeah, ideally we'd have a few additional sizes at the top end of that bracket to make it truly inclusive. This green though is a green that I am absolutely in love with. I think it looks entirely stunning in the way that you've styled it, the way that you've knit it up. And so I really, really do hope you enjoy wearing this jumper, whether as part of that designed outfit or indeed separately as well. The second project that I want to draw your attention to this episode is this version of the Rift Sweater by Jacqueline Seaslack. Now, the thing to bear in mind at this point is you think, obviously, this is a beautiful sweater, excellently styled and incredibly knitted. This is also Kristen Dussault's first ever sweater. Yes, indeed. This is amazing for any knitter to have partaken, but for this to be your first ever garment, honestly, this is such an incredible endeavour and one that you should be incredibly proud of because it looks beautiful. 
Rift is a pattern that we've seen a couple of times both in the Ravelry group here as well as um, just amazing examples that have been knit by some of the group members here in the past. Jacqueline Seaslux patterns are beautiful, they are incredibly size inclusive, Rift, Rift is no exception. This is a gorgeous basic tee, I believe it is knit from the bottom up, uh, which again as a first choice, as a first time construction for a first time garment knitter is a bold choice, so I definitely congratulate you on that as well but um as I say everything from the color palette aesthetic of this entire shot I just need to congratulate you on how beautiful it looks this is a pattern that's knit up with sport weight yarn it has sizing from 40 inches up to I believe 72 let me double check but 72 inches um it's designed to be knit with a little bit of ease as well in there and so definitely something that perhaps is another good throw over sweater for the slightly uh summerier summerier that's a word choice that I appear to have made there. Uh, slightly more summery months to come in the Northern Hemisphere. Similarly, I imagine you could knit this with a slightly sort of thicker weight cotton, potentially even, um, again, at a slightly looser gauge, dare I say it, and have another perfect sort of summer throwover, and at the same time potentially look at adding sleeves and making it winter weather appropriate. So wherever you are in the world, this is a pattern it's worth taking a quick look at. But again, congratulations, Kristen. This is a truly, truly beautiful sweater and I hope it's given rise to a wonderful wealth of opportunities for sweater knitting in your future. I've said before that the Ravelry group is a constant source of inspiration and just going through some of the patterns in there and some of the projects in there, it just really does make me smile. But the last project I want to call out and draw attention to this week really, really did bring a massive grin to my face. This is the Cozy Cocoon Sweater. It is a pattern by Kate Jackson. I will include the picture here and this is a picture of the pattern worked up by Nitty Goodness. The fact here is this is a gorgeous hug of a rainbow and what could be more appropriate for Pride Month? Yes, this is just a literal rainbow hug and it genuinely brought the biggest smile to my face when I saw it. The Cozy Cocoon Sweater is a, a sort of wrap shrug type pattern. Uh, it's knit in Aran weight yarn and it is designed to be knit all in one piece and again is just a bit of a cuddle of a cardigan. This is something that could be used um, and I believe Nitty Goodness used Nitty Goodness used scraps to work this up. Um, it just so happens that her scraps formed a perfect rainbow. Um, something for all of us to aspire to, I think. But um, yeah, it just looks like the most coziest, snuggliest of wraps. And again, for those slightly chillier evenings, whatever hemisphere you happen to be in, if chilly evenings are a thing, this is a pattern and this is a garment that I think would suit you very, very well. So Nitty Goodness, I hope you're enjoying uh, wearing your little cozy cocoon. I think it looks fantastic and um, yeah, I really do think this is a pattern it's worth taking a bit of a look at if this is the sort of thing that floats your boat. Once again, as I mentioned, the Ravelry group is a constant source of inspiration and frankly, all round joy. So I do urge you to take a look over there if you are struggling or perhaps just want to take a little bit of inspiration from others who are knitting. The whole purpose of knitting vicariously, as I've said before, is about capturing that inspiration, taking joy in the potential of things that we can work on, even if we don't have the time, the means, the energy to do it ourselves every single time celebrating the things that other folks are making designing and just coming up with is part of the joy of the craft itself but that is pretty much it for this time round. I really do hope as ever that you're all well, that you are dealing with the constant pandemic as best you can and that if knitting is a source of comfort and solace for you that you're able to do that right now. I will be back in a couple of weeks time but in the meantime I really do wish you a wonderful rest of day, rest of week. I hope your knitting is keeping you happy and fulfilled and I hope that even if it isn't, you have the opportunity to knit vicariously. Keep on keeping on and I will speak to you again very, very soon. Bye. I know this is usually the point at which in the episode that I will showcase some of the outtakes, some of the 
tongue tripping and some of the general fuck uppery that I have had throughout the course of recording this episode. However, what I wanted to do this time around was something a little bit different and just remind you once again of what we talked about right up front in the episode, which is to say that all of us can choose right now to make a difference, continue to be uncomfortable and support the causes of Black Lives Matter and anti-racism. I have included links for you to explore more and donate at the bottom of this uh, video in the description box below. If you are able to do that, please go and do so. I've also included a link to BIPOC in Fibre, the website that I mentioned that celebrates and showcases really, really incredibly talented makers of colour. If you don't have the opportunity to donate funds, please do go and explore that a little bit further. And as with everything else, we have opportunities to go and continue to challenge, to question, to educate ourselves and others to the best of our abilities. And um, really by choosing to do that, we are making a conscious effort and continuing to further the cause. So it is uncomfortable. It is an opportunity for us to, to really go and push ourselves a little bit further, but it's only really through doing that that we are going to start to see any form of change.